So unfortunately, the expression probability theory can be very scary. People don't like it, they don't study it, it's more mathematics. It's very... So how many people said so-so? Just lift. Um, and how many people said not too much? Who said they were experts? <laughs> Good. We don't need to be experts to use the world of uh, tools of probability in machine learning. With even just a little bit of probability, we can reshape our thinking to do many different interesting things, and really, we can change the world in some sense with just a little bit. So I hope over the next uh, three hours, we'll figure that out. Um, ben explained a little bit about my background to you all. I am South African, very proudly still, come very often, uh, many familiar faces, spent some time in Cambridge, in Canada, and have been at DeepMind for uh, many years now. I wanted to, as we begin this session, since we are in South Africa, to dedicate um, sort of this lecture that I will give you to one of the um, historical figures of South Africa that I always think about. Her name was Krotoa. Krotoa is actually, because we are in the Western Cape, was one of those people, she was actually the daughter of a very famous tribal leader, and was one of those people who was the principal interpreter for the Dutch settlers who came here to this part of the country. She is the first of many things. She was obviously this first interpreter who worked for Jan van Riebeck, who was the settler of South Africa. She was the first person to be baptized as a Christian in South Africa. She was the first woman of color, black woman, to be involved in an interracial marriage in South Africa. She was banished to Robben Island, like many of our other heroes. She is, in fact, a mother today of the Afrikaans community and anyone even up to um, F.W. de Klerk traces their history to, um, to Krotoa, and she has been memorialized a few years ago at the Cape of Good Hope. So I think the point for just to tell you this story is for us, when we do travel to places, to recognize the history of those places, to recognize sort of the impact of history that we are living in when we see those places. And I think to connect that to what we're going to do over the next two weeks, the work of machine learning will have similar kinds of impacts today and in the future and on peoples to come. So if we reflect on those histories, then we will work towards a more responsible kind of machine learning. So um, if we just remember Krotoa and a bit of a history on her impact here in the Western Cape. So another question I would like to ask you all is, what is machine learning? Are there, is there anyone who might want to just shout out a quick definition? Just shout out hands. I'll pick on someone, Kwanda. Yes. <laughs> So, Sid Kalikwanda says it is the study of automation and it is the way of mining data to make decisions. Who else wants to give me um, a, another definition? There are many others. Julia. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, automatically uh, exploiting data. Who else? Carl. I met Carl 11 years ago in Cambridge, actually, and this is the first time we are seeing each other since we finished in Cambridge. What is your definition of machine learning? So, Carl gave us a good uh, clarification. Structure in data. Ben, you are probably the longest person working in machine learning here. What is your definition? <laughs> hmm. Okay, so Ben is very different. For him, machine learning is probabilistic modeling. Anyone else whose name I don't know, who I'd like to get to know, wants to give us a definition? Function approximation. What was your name? Anshu. Okay, Anshu Man. Okay, Anshu Man said it's about function approximation. Great. One more person, maybe a lady, perhaps that I didn't pick on? No? I'll wait. Okay, so, yes. 
glorified curfit. Okay, this is going to be a great topic for our debate. And what was your name? C.A. Okay, great. So um, I think all of these are good definitions of machine learning. And please, if you feel the urge to give another one, just shout it out, lift up your hand. I will always define machine learning as two different kinds of things. We are lucky that we are both a science, in which case we have to explore new kinds of knowledge, we have to advance the state of knowledge, and there are new things to discover, but we are simultaneously also a field of engineering, in which case there are products, there are applications, there are practical issues of deploying the problems of data and learning into the real world. So I define machine learning usually as a pathway from principles to products. And this is sort of, will capture everything that we want to think about, and that basic hierarchy of knowledge that we want to do and that you are going to get over the next two weeks is the principles of machine learning. This will include these tools of probability theory, of Bayesian analysis, hypothesis testing, estimation theory, asymptotics. I think every single one of these topics you will cover in the next two weeks. Once we have these principles, they are the principles of mathematics, statistics, we will then use that to build a set of informational quantities. These informational quantities are things like uncertainty. How much information do I gain when I accumulate a bit of data? Causality, you heard a bit about that this morning. How can I detect cause and effect, estimate its cause and effect, and use that to decision making? And the one that's very common in machine learning, the workhorse, is how do I just make predictions of future events given data or observations of past events? With principles and information, you can do more things. You can do sort of the work that is called AI, the questions of reasoning, the things that make you and I somehow special. We can do very long-term planning. I need to drive from Stellenbosch to Cape Town or to George or to back to Johannesburg. We can explain why certain events happen in the world. We can say that having seen some data, this must be because of this, and there are many different roles of explanation. The principal way of doing explanation is through causal explanations, but you get other kinds of explanations through categorization, for example, what we would call clustering in machine learning. Then you have this idea of doing very fast, rapid, one-shot learning, how you can create mental simulations and mental models of data, and how you can detect that there are objects people, table, chairs, and that there are relations between these objects in the world in terms of how they connect with each other. And then, of course, once we have these tools, we can build those applications which we see in the promise of machine learning and of artificial intelligence. We can build that new kind of assistive technologies that help people who need the help they need, whether it's text-to-speech, whether it's better, more smarter wheelchairs, whether it's sort of other kinds of accessibility tools. We will use the role of machine learning to advance the kind of science that we are working on, whether that is here in South Africa, the square kilometer array, other high energy sciences and physics, new ways of doing energy, for example, in fusion, climate uh, and energy, I've just mentioned. Healthcare is one of the biggest areas affecting us, and healthcare and machine learning is now increasingly one of the largest topics. Fairness and safety, how is it that we build these kind of tools that work across many different kinds of people, context, scenarios, countries, and situations, and of course, any kinds of autonomous systems, whether those are robotics, UAVs, or self-driving cars. They all need all these tools to come together, and so we are lucky as machine learners that almost every other field of science, every other field of mathematics, every other field of engineering is our field to play with, to learn with, to engage with, and to do, and to change the world with. So, I always think to think about principles of products, and many of you, each of us, will start at a different place in this hierarchy. Some of us will start here, like I used to, as a foundational methods in Bayesian analysis, and we will try to work our way up this hierarchy. Other people choose a pro a pro uh, an application. They want to make significant changes in healthcare, and once they do that, they need to access all these other tools. Other people are looking at those fundamental cognitive tasks and how they explain human behavior, and they may work in these other areas. So for each of you, just take a minute to think about where you sit in this hierarchy and sort of how it is you navigate the different paths from principles to products. So we're going to do two parts. Um, this thing keeps falling. So the first part uh, I call foundations, and we're going to do things that you may be familiar with already, but I always think it is useful for us 
to, to look through them when we want to think about these seeds of probabilistic thinking. So we have three learning objectives for this session. I want you to think about the language um, of machine learning and a little bit about the philosophy of machine learning, what it means to do learning in different kinds of ways and what are the kinds of frameworks that we use to think about machine learning and learning systems in general. I want us to use one of those paradigms of thinking, what I call the model inference and algorithm paradigm, and then how you should use that as a tool to navigate um, how you will approach and work with machine learning. And the third one, I want you to you think about probabilistic modeling and how it is applied in all the areas of decision making and learning that we think about, whether that's in supervised learning, in unsupervised learning, and in reinforcement learning. So these are the three. And please, at any time, stop me, shout out. There are no stupid questions. Um, we can ask interesting questions from the most basic. And there are several places where I will ask you to do a little bit of work yourself. So this is the first one. Again, a little discussion for all of you while I fix the mic. I would like you to discuss with your neighbor what you think the definition of probability is. So the question is, what is probability? And please discuss with your neighbor, and then I'm going to ask a few of you um, afterwards to just give me your definition. Um, can I get someone to help me fix this? I have a new mic, so we can come back together. Um, would someone new like to give me a definition of probability? Anyone? There are lots of discussions, so there's certainly a, an opinion. What is probability? Yes? The quantification of uncertainty. What was your name? Tracy. So Tracy says it's the quantification of uncertainty. Uh, another definition. Mm -hmm. Yes? The occurrence of an event over periods of time. That's really good. There are at least six definitions of probability that we use um, today in modern mathematics. There are only four which I think are useful. You've given me two, so there should be another two. Um, more definitions. There's the easiest one, the one you learned the first time someone mentioned the word probability to you. You. Oh, a likelihood. OK, that's a good one. Yeah, so th um, uh, in this sort of more colloquial expression of likelihood, this is the definition of probability, a frequency of something occurring. Likelihood is a technical term that we'll talk about later that when we talk in a technical space, we won't use that way. Another definition. One more. Somewhere at that side at the back. Yes? A measure of beliefs over an outcome. There's one more definition. No one ever seems to get this one. Does anyone? Bernard, do you have a definition? Yes? A number between zero and one. I like this. This is great. And actually, a number between zero and one can be the most fundamental thing we think about. But I'll come back to you later on, and we'll question this basis of a definition. Um, OK, so let's look at four definitions of probability. The first one is sort of what was mentioned at the back, that we have the statistical probability. It is the frequency ratio of items that have occurred. You just you roll the dice, you count the number of sixes. That is the frequency ratio definition of probability. This is the one that we all learned, the first one that we think about. And it's um, still a very useful one. And later on, as you do a bit more frequent statistics, this frequency ratio will be important. And when we do proofs of the correctness of a machine learning algorithm, its safety mechanisms will often use this definition to come back to show that something is correct. Um, this is the one that some, most people don't get. This one is called logical probability, but I think it's very natural, related to the zero and one. It is the degree of confirmation of a hypothesis based on a logical analysis. And most of us don't do logic anymore, though I think maybe we should do a little bit more of it. So logic is the basis of probability, um, and probability will extend all the rules of logic to the continuous space. And so all the rules of logic will be subsumed by the rules of probability. So if we know this rule, then we can do logic quite easily. Um, a third one, this one we use sort of inherently, but we don't talk about it in machine learning. But if you read in statistics and other areas in psychology, you will use this definition. It's the propensity theory of probability. It is that probability is only something that is useful for prediction. 
the zero one definition is sort of in this vein of the propensity theory that I only need to have a probability of something if I'm predicting something. I don't use probabilities to describe events, and I don't use probabilities to look at hypotheses and confirmations of events. And then there's this one, which was also mentioned at the back. This is what is called the subjective probability. The probability is a degree of belief in an event. Now, all of these definitions, for the first three, there'll be a little bit of an issue that will occur if you think a little bit too hard that will make it fall apart. There'll be a little corner case that you won't be able to deal with. You'll have to divide by zeros. What happens if you never observe an event in the world and so you can't use this statistical definition of probability. What if things are continuous? Then the logical probability does not apply. Propensity theory is, is weak because we don't only use probabilities to describe propensities or predictions. We use them also for explanations that I just meant. So this definition of belief is the most general definition of probability that we will have. Um, but the point for whatever definition of probability that you like, probability is the sufficient task that Tracy mentioned for reasoning under uncertainty. And this is the key bit, and all of them will be consistent with each other, so it doesn't matter however you got to probability. So I will always ask you to think of probability as the degree of belief, because it is the most general definition of probability that we have. Right? And so probability is the measure of a belief in a proposition given evidence. And I think this word given evidence I cannot stress enough. It is a description of a state of knowledge. And states of knowledges can be future knowledges, which are predictions, past knowledges, observations. They can be hypotheses, things which we are hypothesizing that may occur, or they can be other things which are inconsistencies that we want to reason about. So states of knowledge are important. And there are three, I think there are three important things just to be clear about. There is no such concept as the probability of an event. Again, I want to stress the importance of evidence. There can only be a probability because probabilities must be dependent on evidence. So no such thing as the probability. The value of the probability depends on the evidence that is used. So evidence becomes important. So because this definition is inherently subjective, probabilities are dependent on the evidence or the data that the observer sees, that we will see, that the machine learning designer sees, that the engineer uses. And then, of course, the final one, this is sort of what is captured into many theorems, that different observers with different information will have different beliefs by construction. The converse of that is that if two of us have the same set of data, we will, because the consistency of probability, have the same set of beliefs. And so we're going to unpack all three of these a little bit more in detail. But I think this is very important that probability is not some mysterious thing. It's just the way that we are going to manipulate our evidence correctly and then include that. So there are many different kinds of probabilistic quantities that we are going to unpack together and that you aren't going to unpack over the rest of the two weeks. The first one is the basic concept of probability, and I'm going to use this slide to explain a little bit of my notation. So there is P of X. So P will always be the probability of an object of a random variable X, and I'm not going to make a distinction between the random variable and a realization. So just X is a variable that I can manipulate. I will sometimes use P star of X to represent that P star is a more special di distribution. It is the unknown true distribution. So that's what P star will be. And then sometimes I will want to compare two distributions, a P distribution, and I will just call a different distribution Q, just so you know that there are two distributions, but they are probability distributions. The conditions for probability that was mentioned at the back, that probabilities must be greater than zero, and they must sum or integrate to one. This is what we'll call the classical definition of probability. And I hope some of you, as you go through your career, will question these conditions of probability. There's no reason to actually assume this definition of probability. If you wanted to work in a different definition, there's only one other um, consistent theory of probability, which we'll call sort of the quantum probability theory. In quantum probability theory, probabilities need not be greater than zero. They can be amplitude 
means they can be complex numbers and their integrals don't need to be to one. They must just have norms which are one. And so some of you will eventually come across this quantum probability theory and there you will get a different kind of thing. But everything we will talk about, about estimation theory, has an analog in the quantum probability space. And maybe there'll be a future for machine learning, quantum machine learning in that, sort of questioning the basic definition. But we can do a lot already um, just with this definition. Bayes' rule is the most fun foundational one. Bayes' rule is very simple. It is just the rule for inverting probabilities. If I have a probability of x given z, Bayes' rule will give us the rule to switch to get the probability of p of z given x. And how I will do that to transform from 1 to invert the distribution is by using this ratio of p of z divided by p of x. It's just a way of renormalizing the probability so that we satisfy that it's sum to x and it's greater than 0. Then there is the parameterization of a model. Usually I will write it either in two ways, p subscript theta of x given z. Then I will tell you that z gives you the probability of x using some other parameters theta. So there's a function that lives inside this conditioning bar. And sometimes I will write it this way, p of x, condition on z with a semicolon theta, to let you know very explicitly that there are these parameters theta that we're going to use, manipulate, make gradients, we're going to update them in some way. The expectation is the one you will see everywhere. This is the way we usually write it in most of machine learning, the expectation e under the distribution p of theta give x given z of a function f. Now the function f, so the function and the distribution must have the same parameter, the same variable, so that's why x must appear in both. But the function f can have different parameters, which I will call functions phi. Sometimes you can call those structural parameters, so these are phi, and then you have these thetas, which are distributional parameters, they are theta. So, and then this expectation is always written out as the integral of p times f. So we'll just keep that definition there. And then the gradient of a function f is then just the partial derivative with respect to theta, and in multivariate cases, the gradient collects all the partial derivatives of all the thetas, right? So the gradient, the definition of the gradient is the collection of all the partial derivatives under all the parameters. And everywhere you'll see I've written things both, which means I want you to recognize that they are all multivariate quantities, um, but, you know, because the univariate case is actually easier. But for machine learning, we aren't really interested in univariate cases. So, okay, there are four statistical operations that we will usually encounter. And the first one, which is the one that many of you mentioned, is where does our data come from? So we'll call this data enumeration. And data enumeration, when you are working in the real world, I've worked in problems in healthcare, other problems in climate, other problems in other areas, getting the data is really 90% of the work. And so getting the data, how you do that process is very important. And once you have your data, there are usually two kinds of things you will do with your data. You will either summarize your data. Summarization is this process of asking, in a collection of data, what is it that makes this data similar? What are those structural properties? This was the definition Carl gave us. He said there is some structure in the data and summarization is that process of putting all the data together to find that structure. But we can do the opposite of that. The opposite of summarization is comparison, is to tear the data apart. What is it that makes every data point different from another data point? Why is that data point different? Comparison is a very fundamental operation, and usually these two processes of summarization and comparison, we need to always do both of them. And then, of course, we have the principle of inference. Inference is once you have a data and either a question of summarization or comparison, how is it that you put those two things together? And so statistical inference then lies at the core of all the kind of statistical operations. But there are always these four statistical operations. When we operate in this quadrant of using our data and looking at the process of summarization, we will call that modeling typically. If we look at data for the process of comparison, then usually we will call that experimental design. How is it we can find different kinds of designs and find the differences? When we are looking at summarization for inference, we will often talk about estimation or learning, depending on whether we are being statisticians, machine learners, operations research, econometricians. And then if we look at the process of inference for statistical comparisons, we'll call that hypothesis testing. And so, again, all of these things are something we all need to know about quite deeply because we will encounter all of them when we are doing the real work of machine learning. 
So the first kind of area that I wanted to, is there sort of any question or comment on these four statistical operations actually before we carry on? Yes. Yes? Yeah, yeah. So th the reason is that there must still be a consistency with this classical probability. And it's always, the classical consistency is always there, but you just get a broader set of solutions. What was your name? Amira. Amira makes a great, a great point, which is again this point of why mathematics is so good, is that usually there is a consistency. So whatever way you look at things, those four definitions of probability, I guess, gave you in the beginning, they're all consistent with each other, though the philosophy of approaching them was very different. And this philosophy and mathematics of quantum probability and classical probability has that same kind of parallel. I'll show you a few other examples going on. Um, any other comments or questions, thoughts? Then let's uh, move on to thinking about probabilistic modeling itself. So probabilistic modeling is the one of the core tools that I want you to have. Um, and a model is a description of the world, of data, of a potential scenario or a process. So a model is a very generic object, but a model, the key word is description. A model is a description. So when I write a model, I'm saying that there is a description of something that I'm giving. And so that description is important because you need to interrogate your description. Your description may be wrong. It will differ from someone else's description. Description is really important. The role of probability is for us to assess different kinds of descriptions. And a probabilistic model will just turn those kind of descriptions and write those descriptions in the language of probability so that we can think about uncertainties, variations, and uh, resampling. So here's an example of a very simple um, probabilistic model of the world. It is also simultaneously a causal model or causal graph in the way that I've written it. I'm thinking about traffic jams. This is something you have in Johannesburg a lot. Um, there could be bad weather. There could be an accident on the, on the highway, which then could cause. There are sirens that you've heard, what's going on, peak hour. These are all the things that I'm interested in that world of getting on the highway to go from um, somewhere to somewhere else. And so you can write this out as a probabilistic model where every circle represents a probability distribution, which means there's some variation in that. So we can ask several probabilistic questions. What is the probability of a traffic jam just in general? That's a, that's a useful question, a baseline probability. Um, if I hear sirens, what is the probability that there was an accident? So even though I wrote in my model that accidents lead to sirens, I may not observe accidents, but I may only hear the siren because I'm far away. How can I invert that probability? A probabilistic model helps us do that. I can do the same thing if I observe traffic jams. Can I say whether it's, not, it's a peak hour or not if I'm in a new city and I don't know when the peak hours are? So most models in machine learning will be probabilistic models. They may not even be look like probabilistic models. They may use other frameworks of thinking that make you think they are not probabilistic models, but most of them are. There are very few. I actually struggle to think of one um, right now that is not a probabilistic model or that cannot be using the tools of probabilistic thinking to write it as a probabilistic model. Um, so again, as I said, probabilistic models let you learn probability distributions of data, and you can choose what to learn. This is why being probabilistic is flexible. You can choose to learn just the mean of the distribution, or if you want, you can choose to learn a few elements of the distribution, or if you really want, you can learn the whole distribution. This is a choice you get to make. No one tells you that this is the way to do it. Depending on the problem and how sophisticated you want to be, there is a choice, but probabilistic models mean that you can do all of that. So there is a centrality of inference in this role of models in that previous diagram of the four statistical operations that I gave you. And you know this is just a personal view, but I really consider the question of inference to be the central research question for us in machine learning. Because if we are thinking about AI or AGI, that means that these four statistical operations, the most refined form of these statistical operations, will be AGI, and because the peak and the summit of these operations is inference, then 
the questions of inference become those questions of AGI. So I think I spend most of my own research thinking about these questions of what it means to do inference, what are the different ways of doing statistical inference, how they relate to each other, because I find it so central, and I will talk a lot more about statistical inference in 15 minutes or so. So here's a model hopefully we all are familiar with to some extent. It's linear regression. It is the most basic model for which all other things in machine learning, statistics, any computational science is built on this model. And, um, it is the simplest model that you can think of. It says that I have data X, and I'm going to form a linear combination of those data points X to explain, to make a prediction. So I'm going to call eta a predictor, which is a linear function of some parameters W of X. You can ignore the B, but the B is just uh, an offset. So W transpose X is the linear function in W. It's a straight line, a description of this straight line in the multivariate setting. And then a probabilistic description of this straight line says that I have a straight line, like in this cartoon, but there are a distribution around every point, around every prediction. And I can choose up front what I think that distribution will be like. Uh, if you use a Gaussian distribution, so I say I observe data Y, these are outcomes, given some data x, if it's a Gaussian distribution, then that corresponds directly to what we call linear regression. So linear regression will take y of some function which of a predictor eta with some parameters theta. The parameters theta are w and b, and this linear predictor is this straight line linear function. So in a picture, if you just use the picture, I get data point in, I get a little box, I may transform this eta through some other pointwise function, the identity function in this case here, and I will get an outcome. So this is the simplest building block, and with this building block, we will be able to do every other computational statistical operation that has ever been written about. So this basic linear function can be anything. It can be the linear function that we just wrote, this affine function, but you have other kinds of linear functions like convolutions against the Fourier basis or other kinds of orthogonal bases. Um, and so you can choose any kinds of linear functions or even other nonlinear functions, polynomials or um, other orthogonal, orthogonal functions. G, if we are in statistical language, we'll call that an inverse link function. But if we were doing more modern machine learning, people will call this the activation function. These are the same word for the same quantity. And you have many different kinds of link functions depending on the type of output data. If you have real value data in the output and you want to do what we'll get is linear regression, if we use the identity link um, as our activation function. If we have binary outcomes and whatever data as an image and the input, then we can get several different kinds of regressions on binary outcomes. Logistic regression uses the sigmoid function as that output, but you can get other kinds of regressions. Probit regression is one where we'll use as the link function, the Gaussian CDF, or you get other kinds of what we'll call gumball regression, which will use this complementary log-log function as this activation. There are lots of choices to make here. Most people never consider the other ones. They always just use the sigmoid um, because it's easy to compute, very easy dif to differentiate. But the others have interesting properties as well. If you are going to do any work in psychology, for example, where you're going to look at the way humans make choices between different kinds of outcomes, then you will usually consider the other ways of doing this kind of logistic regression. Um, I'll point out maybe another one just for why it's important to read in other areas, which is what is called the Tobit regression. Tobit regression is often most discussed in economics, where we are looking at economic outcomes, and there they use as their activation function just the max of zero and the straight line. So if, if you are doing any deep learning, that function is called the rectified linear unit or the ReLU unit, and in, uh, in economics they call this the Tobit function or the uh, and gives you the Tobit regression. So there's lots of deep connections. Um, and then usually what you will be asked is to just optimize the likelihood. Take the negative log of this quantity, take the gradient with respect to theta, learn that thing. And for linear regression, you can actually solve this in closed form. So then you will know the solution, and those closed form solutions have the name the normal equations. Right? So if anyone mentions to you the normal equations, what they mean is this linear regression model on some multidimensional set of data. Okay, 
But usually the world can't really be described by a linear function. It's very rare to find something that's linear. So then we often need to consider something nonlinear. And so this is where we're going to extend that basic concept of linear regression uh, into a more richer kind of structure. So what I'm just going to ask you to do is the simplest thing that you can imagine. Just compose that basic linear function several times. Composition is the basic operation of mathematics, and so that's what we're going to do. Here's the first blue box with a linear predictor eta squashed to some activation or link function. Repeat this box, take the output of this with a new box. This you can call several different kinds of names. Naturally, because of the way I've explained it to you, you could call this a recursive linear model or the recursive generalized regression. But in um, the way we do it in deep learning or machine learning, we'll call this a deep neural network or a deep network, right? This kind of recursive composition of linear functions. And so if I just write it out for you, that expectation and the outcome is just the composition of functions h on x, and h is just one big box. And so you have lots of flexibility of now experimenting with what a box means, and you have then also a separate kind of flexibility of thinking about how you stack boxes. And a lot of the fun work we've done in deep learning is around these two questions. What goes into a box? What constitutes the basic operation of a function? And how do you connect these different boxes? What are the correct ways of doing recursive composition of functions? And there's a whole theory of recursive compositions um, in theoretical spaces, in probability theory, but also practical spaces by reading new kind of deep learning papers. So this kind of framework is don't be afraid of deep learning. Don't don't hate it too much, don't love it too much, but it is just one of those very flexible tools you have, a framework for building rich nonlinear parametric functions. And I'm putting these words nonlinear and parametric because these are the key characteristics of this kind of model. You can have linear models like linear regression that are parametric, and then you may want to not have parametric models but other kinds of models. So we can think of non-parametric or semi-parametric models. Um, I'm not sure you're going to cover any of those this week or, or the next two weeks, but use that as one of the ways for future learning. So the likelihood which came up earlier. The likelihood is one of those fundamental concepts of uh, probability and of learning in general. So a probabilistic model is described as follows. It says I have some data y um, and maybe some inputs x um, if I'm conditioning, depending on what I'm doing. And I write out a model as the probability of that outcome y with some function which h which transforms x and using parameters theta. So that's every probabilistic model starts out being written that way. And I will call something a likelihood function. And a simple likelihood function is just to take the log of this uh, probability distribution. And I'll sum it maybe over all the data points. Now, the reason we call it a likelihood function is that likelihoods are functions of parameters. So here, this is the probability of the data, but this is the likelihood of parameters. So I just want to make this language clear. You should never write or say the likelihood of data. That's a meaningless statement. You want to say the likelihood of parameters because likelihoods are characterizations of how a parameter explains data. So there's a sort of a technical subtlety that we're using here. Um, maybe it's time for a little question for everyone. Who has heard of this expression of likelihood before in these kind of technical? Just lift your hands. Likelihood functions and uh, maximum likelihood. Good. Um, who wants to give me a definition of um, why is the likelihood useful? Anyone who raised your hand? Is there was there like a fundamental reason that we are so obsessed with these likelihood functions and that without you even understanding, you see a likelihood function in your first class? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, okay, the likelihood function is exactly going to connect the parameter configuration that we have to the data that, we, that we've observed and gives us that explanation. Effective, the likelihood is the goodness of our explanation of a particular model. Any other thought in the likelihood, the likelihood function? Who doesn't like the likelihood function? I've also not found someone who is a, a likelihood hater. Hmm, you guys need to be a bit more critical. A few li maybe we'll get make a few likelihood haters at the end of the session. Um, so there are many, many good reasons to use a likelihood function. 
Um, and I'm going to give you a small little set. The first one is around this basics of what we we'll call estimation theory, of uh, why something works well. And the reason we want something to work well is that we want it to be efficient. Efficient in a statistical sense means that when you optimize those parameters, you will get the best make the best use of data as possible. So every data has a certain amount of variance that is inherent in the data, which you cannot exceed. The theory that characterizes that variance is called the kramer rao lower bound. And if we use likelihood functions, we can actually, in certain cases, achieve the kramer rao lower bound, which means that there is no other way of learning a set of parameters that will mean we will get a better way of using the data that we have. So likelihoods if you can get a good likelihood, can help you be statistically efficient. If we see an infinite amount of data, when we use a likelihood model, because it will satisfy all the rules of probability that we are interested in, we will know that we will have unbiased, which means in expectation will be correct, and as n goes to infinity, we will achieve the true solution. This is what consistency means. Um, and then there are other th information theoretical properties. I think when you hear Arthur Gretton speak, he will talk a little bit about um, hypothesis testing. And hypothesis testing and the likelihood itself means that you can create hypothesis tests that are called with good power. They are tests that actually let you do this work of comparison, to tease things apart, to say that one data point is different from another one and to say with what confidence that occurs. And if you use the likelihood, you can create a likelihood ratio test. And the likelihood ratio test is one of the most powerful ways we have of creating a statistical test. And if we use these likelihoods, we can also create confidence intervals around the parameters that we learn, and those confidence intervals are useful. Likelihoods mean that we can build very, very flexible models. If we have data that is incompletely observed, so there's missingness, there's some sort of distortion in the data because of the measurement process, the storage process, the decompression process, if there are some bias in the sampling process even, then we can use the likelihood function to correct those errors and inconsistencies. We sort of need to know something about those inconsistencies, but if we do know them, the likelihood gives us the way of doing that correction, and you can, uh, as I said, and one of the other things that the likelihood does well, um, and very naturally and automatically, is that it lets us pool information. We can combine different sources of data, disparate sources, audio and video, and uh, together into one sort with text as well. And even knowledge that comes outside of the data, typically we'll call this metadata that you have associated with every data set, knowledge outside of the data can be used. That knowledge can be metadata, it can also be constraints um, of various forms. But likelihoods are not perfect, and in fact one of the key problems when you think about likelihoods from the statistical process is this question of misspecification. A misspecified likelihood or a misspecified probabilistic model is a model that doesn't quite capture everything we need to know about the model and the world, in which case there is a mismatch between the data and reality and the model that we have. And when we have a high degree of misspecification, then all the benefits of that likelihood that you have will not apply because we won't get the efficient estimates. We won't get the kramer rao low bound. We won't get the correct kind of confidence interval, and our hypothesis test might fail, or it might just not tell us anything. So we need to be careful, and so the design of models becomes very important. And you'll see this need for specification and avoidance of misspecification appear when we try to find ever more general models, ever more powerful models. You'll see this is the underlying source for that sort of demand that people have for general purpose, black box, super parameterized models so that they can deal with specification or at least be only slightly misspecified. But this is a big research area in its own. So we're going to do uh, three topics in estimation theory very briefly. The one is the one we just discussed, which is, um, so let's write a probabilistic model. Probabilistic model on outcomes y given some side information x. And I will write that as a probability distribution over those outcomes y with parameters theta using some function h which may transform that side information. I will write out a likelihood function a likelihood of the parameters, which is going to describe, as was said earlier, how those parameters describe the data and the goodness of that fit. 
And the first and simplest estimation theory principle is called the maximum likelihood. It's very natural. If the likelihood is something that correctly characterizes, as you said, how the parameters explains the data, then just find the best explanation of the parameter. Maximize the likelihood function. So that becomes an objective for optimization. And this is the straightforward and natural way to learn parameters. It is the first thing you would think of even intuitively. You need to sometimes be careful about maximum likelihood estimation. Even in the simplest case, and the one that you all know, is about computing the variance of a set of samples. You can use n, or you can divide by n, or you can divide by n minus 1. The dividing by n is what happens when you compute using maximum likelihood because maximum likelihood can give you biased estimators in finite sample sizes. And it took a while until we figured out, oh, there are ways of doing unbiased estimators. So we'll have to sort of question um, these kind of issues. So usually you would never want to do maximum likelihood on its own exactly because of this problem, that you will have to be like Bonferroni who spent years to then create a correction of n minus 1 divided by n to multiply estimator. So we don't want to do that. And overfitting this problem of not being able to generalize, not making good predictions becomes the key problem that we want to do. So we need something better than uh, maximum likelihood as our workhorse of estimation theory. So let's write a new kind of probabilistic model. Um, again, the probabilistic, we'll start with the one we had before, which is the probability of y, some outcome, given some function x, with parameters theta, and I'm going to multiply by one additional distribution, p of theta. Now, this is going to change the model, and this thing, because of Bayes' rule, will be proportional instead to a distribution of p of theta, given the data that we observe. So this distribution is the inverse. The principle of modeling now was not to model the data that I saw, but to model instead the parameters that I have, and then to use the parameter instead. So again, we can create a different kind of likelihood function. If I have this thing, I can take the log of that and sum it over all the data points I observe. That will split into two things. There will be the likelihood function that we just had when we're doing maximum likelihood estimation, but there will be some additional term that will appear. This additional term has many, many different names. And you can choose many things for this P of theta distribution. You can choose a Gaussian distribution for it. Um, which means that you think before you ever saw any data, your parameters looked like a Gaussian. You can have an L1, which means you think they are very sharp using the absolute value, or you can have some other kinds of norms, and there are fancier ways of doing that. You can assume it's a mixture of a Gaussian and a spike at zero, what we'll call a spike and slab for it. So many different ways of choosing this probability distribution theta. But what this gives us is a new kind of estimation theory, and this is a theory which is called maximum a posteriori, or just map estimation. And the optimization objective is no different. It says just optimize the map objective itself. And so here's a little cartoon. I have shaped this likelihood function, and there is a maximum of that point. But because this function describes this modified objective, we'll get a new kind of... So as I said, this is going to be a generalization of the likelihood function that we had before. In the previous one, if you had chosen this p of theta as a uniform distribution, then we'll get what was, what was in the previous slide, those bias, potentially biased maximum likelihood estimators. So this is just a more wider set of distributions. Usually, sometimes this will be called shrinkage, right? Because it's intuitive. You want to take your parameters and shrink them back to the p of theta that you thought you had in the beginning. So we'll call these kind of things shrinkage estimators sometimes and penalized regression estimators. Um, but one of the things that there are many ways of coming up with a regularizer R that won't necessarily correspond to a probability distribution P of theta. So um, don't be wedded to one way or the other. Be a bit more flexible in the way you are thinking. Um, because a lot of the work these days happens around thinking of regularizers that don't necessarily correspond to probability distribution. But of course, if you can represent them as a probability distribution, you can do a lot more. So yeah, as I said, this is called regularization. Regularization is essential to overcome the limitations of maximum likelihood regression. And there are many other names, regularization, 
penalized regression, shrinkage. Um, and so when you are searching, you'll see these other names in other literatures. And many, many different kinds of regularization techniques. Using a large data set is one of those techniques. Just making the data bigger is a way, because one of the ways you can think about data is as a constraint in your model. Every data point is a constraint. The more constraints you have, the better you can learn your parameters, the more data, so that's why you want to have more data. But sometimes you can just add noise to your data so that you can actually not overfit or there's a bit more continuity. L1, L2 regularization, which is very common, what they sometimes call weight decay, or using a Gaussian prior, depending. You can use binary or Gaussian dropout, which are more recent. Batch norm normalization, even more recent technique. And the ones at the bottom, these two, don't necessarily have well-defined ways of writing them as probability distributions, but do work well in practice and do have the kind of consistency tools that you want to still show you are learning the correct thing. So there are some useful ways, reasons why we are interested in map estimation. Um, map estimation helps us think of a different way of doing solutions. In map estimation, we make a distinction between what is maximum and what is typical. And we don't want the thing that is maximum, because the thing that is maximum may be extremely rare. It may have occurred only once. And generalization means we don't want to fit on things that have occurred only once. So instead, we want typical solutions, not maximum solutions. And so map estimation, by adding that regularization term, helps us transform to typical solutions instead. If you wanted to do uncertainty, map estimation does not help you do uncertainty, but we do have other tools that we will use to help give us uncertainty, especially by using bootstrap and other ways of doing confidence intervals. And then I think one of the issues with map estimation that we'll read in many places is that map estimation can be parameterization sensitive. It matters how you write your model out and the kind of solution that you get. So I think let's just think a little bit. We're going to do a bit of an exercise together so um, we all aren't all sleeping. So here's a very popular example. This is the rule for the change of variables of probability. I have a probability distribution mu. And I have a function that transforms mu into some new variables phi. And the distribution of the new variable, probability of the variable phi, is given by this equation. I take the original probability, p of mu, and I multiply it by a correction factor, which is given by the gradient of the transformation function. So let's do a simple example. Um, here's a Bernoulli distribution, the simplest one. I say I have a coin, y, which is either 1 or 0, and the probability of that coin being 1 or 0 is given by mu. So a fair coin will have mu is equal to 0 0.5. Before I begin, I'm just going to assume that this probability p of mu is always 1. So this is a simple example. And the mode of the prior um, is going to be this quantity. So this is the thing that I'm actually going to be interested in computing. Phi hat of map is going to be arg max of p of phi. So that new model that I created after doing the transformation. And this is the map estimation problem. So I'm going to give you two parameterizations. Maybe everyone on that side of the room, you focus on parameterization one. And everyone on this side of the room, you focus on parameterization two. So here are your two functions. I'm either going to take um, mu or phi, I'm going to square it, and that's going to be mu. Or I'm going to take this other function, 1 minus 1 minus phi squared, as a different kind of function. And the thing I would like you to do is just to scribble on some paper um, what you think the map estimate under these different parameterizations is. So what you're going to do is first compute the new probability distribution, p of phi, by applying this rule and using these transformations. And then take the derivative of that new rule, the log, the derivative of the log of that new rule, set it to zero, and tell me what the answer is. So let's just take two minutes to do that. And I'm going to get some water. Linger too long, because um, I may be not that good at explaining this point. So let's just do it together. The new prior, for everyone on the right-hand side, did, uh, did you sort of get to this point, at least, that the new probability distribution p of phi is just equal to 2 times phi. Roughly, yeah? A few more shakes? Just sort of, did you manage to get that step? Okay, if you got that step, 
then I'm actually pleased because I think that equation and doing that step becomes one of the most foundational tricks that we use in machine learning today. If you can just do that, you can do a lot, and we'll talk about using this a little bit more in the second half. Um, on the other side, those who are doing parameterization too, did you roughly get that this was the new probability distribution? Anyone else on that side? Was there, uh, are there any questions? What questions do you have around this first step? Anything? Was there a confusion that someone had around getting to this, to this first bit? So again, if you manage to get that, I think this is pretty good. Um, and if you don't get the rest, that's fine for the rest of this slide. But the map estimate, so hopefully if some of you got to it, you would have found that the map estimate for those doing parameterization one was one. And the others had a parameterization, a map estimate of zero. Now, this is either going to be surprising to you or you're going to be like, well, whatever, I changed the parameterization, obviously the answer is different. Um, I don't know which camp you're in, but I think this is something just to be aware of and to think about and to worry about. We usually don't want solutions like this where you have so much sensitivity to the parameterization that the answer is completely different. And the reason you don't want to have it is because we don't typically want to be sensitive to the units in which the data comes. If you are sensitive to the unit where the answer is so completely different, then we'll have to do as we always do, so you never really escape this. A lot of work on feature engineering, really going deep down, a lot more cleaning. One of the things we want to do is to try and automate that. So we can help to some extent by thinking of the using estimation theory to help. But if this answer is different, then it affects the way we understand our model, the way we interpret our model, in which case maybe the interpretation that we give is completely different. Of course, if the answers are different, the gradient is different. The gradient affects the optimization path we will take. So that means there could be different kinds of stabilities under different kinds of parameterization. And then it, of course, affects the way we actually actually have to design our model. So it's just something to think about when we are doing invariant map map estimation. And since we are mostly doing map estimation, I think we a lot of things you will see is around thinking about this. So we're going to just show you a little trick. This is a tool which is called invariant map estimation. And the people who are working on invariant map estimation recognize exactly this problem that we just did. They wrote out this example. They were like puzzled. I don't like the zero one kind of thing. So what is the way to reshape your model, reshape that probability model so that it is invariant to this kind of sensitivity to parameterization? Now, those of you who have a little bit of background in uh, information geometry or differential geometry, then you will recognize already that this is a question of differential geometry where we need to think about the shape of our probability spaces. We need to think about their curvature and we can reshape this world of probability so that it always looks like a ball. One of the key things of, of mathematics or machine learning is if we can make things look like a quadratic function, we can always make things work. And so the idea here is to reshape our probability distribution, that likelihood function, so it looks like a quadratic function. So we'll just use one kind of thing. We will compute this quantity i, which is called the Fisher information. The Fisher information is a global quantity over the probability space that we are working in, which helps us effectively reshape this probability function into a quadratic function over the parameter space theta. And then you can take the gradient of this. You'll find this coming up in connections to many other areas, uh, especially around natural gradients and ways of doing optimization based on trust region optimization. Um, and then in probability theory or Bayesian analysis, this kind of invariant estimation is usually comes up under the heading of informative prize or uninformative prize and that distinction between them. So. Um, we have some solutions here, but I think these solutions, they are these, this problem of parameterization, of needing to think carefully about what is typical and maximum, the need for dealing with uncertainty and using extra things, the real fundamental source of those problems has not really been addressed. So we're going to look at one way of dealing with that. So again, we were reasoning about the most likely consequences not all of the consequences. We were maintaining no knowledge of the underlying variability. We were just trying to smooth them or turn things into quadratic functions. So these were the core issues that we saw in the previous one. So I think this motivates us to do a little bit more than just learning what is typical or what is maximum. I think what we should do instead is to learn much more about the distributions. And this 
I guess philosophy about learning more about the distribution than what is typical or maxim is what is this underlies the Bayesian philosophy. So when someone tells you that they are Bayesian, usually all they mean is that they want to learn probability distributions of data rather than single points of data or what is typical or what is um, maximal. So again, I um, uh, you know, subscribe to this Bayesian philosophy, but I aspire to be a very pragmatic Bayesian philosophy. So always do the thing that can give you work. So I do a lot of work in combining deep reasoning, probabilistic reasoning with deep learning, and that is one way of doing a pragmatic approach. And when you um, hear from David Bly, for example, later on today or tomorrow, then you'll see this kind of pragmatic Bayesian approach come up in what he will present. So the pragmatic Bayesian will be Bayesian, will maintain probability distributions over some things, but not necessarily all things. And you will just need to make a judgment about that. Not yet. Um, so that's some of the research as to how we can do distributions over everything. So there are two quantities typically we are interested when we are thinking about a Bayesian analysis. One is the evidence of data. I said the evidence was the foundational element of the definition of probability. So of course, if we want to take that seriously, then the evidence becomes the most important quantity that we want to consider. So the evidence is usually this distribution. I have a probabilistic model, a probability of an outcome Y with some side information X and parameters theta. I may have a prior distribution on this um, parameters theta, and I need to know the evidence, what is the probability of y without regard to those parameters, averaged over all the different kinds of parameters that I could choose. That's what this integral means. I take this likelihood that I have, the likelihood function, which is the function of theta, I average over all the different ways of assigning theta to it, and then I look at what the probability is in the outcome. If that probability is invariant, it does not depend on parameters, then that probability is what we call an evidence. It is the evidence for y given x controlling over all the different ways we can assign parameters. So this is a way of effectively say, if there was a model there, how good is that kind of model? So um, the sort of s related to that is what is called the uh, posterior distribution. Again, there are distributions theta, and those distributions theta are the key quantity, and we're going to look at what is the distribution of theta given the evidence that I have, given the y and the x, and I can use Bayes' rule to do that. So these are the two typical quantities, and they are the sources of all problems in Bayesian statistics and any kind of machine learning where you want to do more than what is typical or maximal. So in Bayesian analysis, this is the key, a very key point. Anything that is not observed, if you don't measure it in your data, but it is in your model, you will have to integrate it out. Integration is the core quant operation of Bayesian analysis. So again, in the first line, I have not observed theta. You can never measure the parameters of your model. And because you can never measure them, they are unobserved, and things that are unobserved must be integrated. And that's why this evidence integral comes up. This is that Bayesian philosophy. So the need to do integration is the difficult operation, and so this is why Bayesian analysis is difficult. And as I said, integration is that central operation. And I want to just explain a little bit about this terminology, you will see written everywhere, and people will speak about it, this concept of intractable integrals. And it's very mysterious what, it took me maybe five years until I properly understood what it means when someone says something is an intractable integral. Often it's something simple, they just don't know it in closed form. The kind of things that we learn in calculus, those are tractable integrals, because they're a simple set of rules that help us solve them, but most integrals, 99.9% .9 of integrals, we can't know in closed form. Another reason for intractability is that even though I'm writing one integral, there are actually d integrals there, right? Because the data is not one-dimensional, it's d-dimensional. So you actually have very high-dimensional integrals and high-dimensional quantities, and you can't compute those high-dimensional quantities. Numerical integration usually only works for two dimensions, not more. So now you are in a case where you have to do d-dimensional integrals for which your numerical tools don't work. What do you do? So there's a lot of stuff we're going to have to think about that. A little bit more on terminology on two words, which you'll hear everywhere, learning and inference. I have already made this kind of sin of interchanging learning and inference and not clarifying it for you. So I think we'll just spend a bit of time to think about it. 
machine learning will typically make a distinction between these two operations of learning and inference. So inference is the reasoning or computation of unknown probability distributions. So when I want to be Bayesian, I'm going to do inference. I'm going to learn those probability distribution, or at least more than just the mean and the variance, a few kind of uh, moments. And usually we'll talk about learning or parameter learning. Parameter learning is finding a point estimate of some quantities in our model. And usually we will do both of them. I'm not sure if you find the EM algorithm at some point in the next two weeks, the EM algorithm we describe as a process of alternating between doing inference over some part of the model and parameter learning over another part. And so you'll find this. But you know, in, in many other places, these two words are used very differently. In statistics, you will only see the word uh, inference appear. And there's no distinction between learning and inference. There's only the problem of inference. And in fact, in statistics, we have a preference to the use the word estimation. We will estimate the parameters that we care about. So when you read in statistics, you know, just do a mental mapping between what words mean. In Bayesian statistics, all quantities need to be distributions. So there's only the problem of inference. We only will ever learn probability distributions over things. In software engineering, especially over the last five years, inference just means forward evaluating a statistical model, a machine learning model. Just taking data in and coming on the output and getting a prediction, that is what is called inference in software engineering. So when you are reading the documentation of TensorFlow, or of PyTorch, they will use inference in this way. It's not the inference we mean when we are learning a model. And usually if we're thinking about more about general decision making, artificial intelligence, learning is the concept they will talk about, but just in a general way of understanding how to act in the future based on past observations. So we can make this mapping and we are flexible enough to jump between all these different kinds of definitions and terminologies. But just keep in mind that sometimes they are subtly different or the assumption that people make will be a little bit different. So there are two streams of machine learning that I think are the biggest ones that people consider right now. Obviously, we have deep learning, doing lots of amazing new results every other week. So deep learning, as I described in the very beginning, is a rich class of models for nonlinear models for classification and sequence prediction. They are very scalable. You can deal with the amount of data. Some of the data that I have used, I cannot even describe how big this data is. It lives over several data sources, several data centers. It can never be actually even understood by one person. So really scalable. And they're conceptually simple. That kind of building block idea, of taking simple blocks and recomposing them um, is something we can all understand. The composition with other gradient-based methods. As long as you have another method that's doing its learning by gradients, you can combine them together. And these days you will find um, another kind of uh, topic which people do work in what they call meta-learning. Meta-learning exploits this idea that gradient methods can be composed of other gradient methods and you will just gradients of the gradient method or gradients of the gradient of the gradient method and then you become very meta in that case. I have some opinions on that that I won't tell you about. Um, there is a negative outcome of this. Of course, we are only interested in point estimates in deep learning typically. And again, I pointed out a lot of the concerns you need to have about what is typical and what is maximum and why we need to do other kinds of things. And it typically can be hard to score these models. It's hard to say when one model is actually better than another. It's hard to do complexity uh, penalization. If you have very complex models, how do you actually use the principle of Occam's razor to come back to the simplest model that you actually have? On the other hand, I think we do have Bayesian reasoning as that other very large area of research. Usually there are disadvantages that you have very simple models. Linear models, conjugate models in which you can compute the integrals in closed form or know the probabilities very cleanly. You have intractable inference. These d-dimensional integrals are huge, can be computationally expensive, long simulation time, not working well for us. But Bayesian reasoning gives us a unified framework for model building, for inference, for prediction, for decision making. All the things we want to do, we can do in one uh, singular conceptual and mathematical framework. We have an explicit accounting for uncertainty and variability of outcomes in, uh, when we are using Bayesian methods, and we are typically very robust to overfitting. Tools for model selection and composition are available to us. So I think the point that I wanted to make is that 
the advantages of one are the disadvantages of the other. And so it's very natural to then combine these two things. And more and more of machine learning is around a convergence of different sub areas to become one larger area. And so as we continue our research and our work together, we will just bring more and more things together so that we can build those larger tools, larger solutions, and make those pathways from principles to products that combine them. So natural to consider. So let's just consider three typical areas. One is supervised learning or Bayesian regression. I want to build a probabilistic model over functions. This is one way of building probabilistic models over functions, and the entire books we can read together on this topic. So we'll start off with the prior. The prior which just says, I have some parameters. As I begin, what is the probability distribution I believe of those parameters? I have a model which will assign probability to data that I actually observe. In this case, I'm going to use a discrete model. I'm going to say the data that I observed is a categorical variable. It is a one of k. It's either one, class one, class two, class three, class four, or class five. And that categorical distribution has probabilities pi, and it may depend on some data x and have some parameters theta. The posterior distribution, that central probabilistic quantity of Bayesian analysis, is to compute the probability of theta given the data or the evidence that we have. So this is the kind of model that you can do um, if you wanted to build a Bayesian neural network. And they give us ways of learning distributions over functions and simultaneously maintaining uncertainty because I have the probability distribution over theta. Um, this can be very difficult to do in big parametric models. And it's difficult because in a deep neural network of this kind, if you are trying to learn a convolutional net of the size that we have today, there may be easily 10 million, 100 million parameters. To maintain a joint distribution of a 100 million parameters is one of the most outrageous things you can think of doing and doesn't work. So actually nothing in this area works. So lots of research to do there. Um, and there are many ways to learn posterior distributions. Uh, another area, the one I've worked in, um, you know, since I was at Wits University until today is this problem of density estimation. How is it that we can learn probability distributions over the data itself? This is the core question of statistics. One of the oldest areas of statistics, actually, um, Fisher and Pearson themselves were working on this problem 120 years ago. So we can learn distributions over some things and point estimates of the others. This is what I said about being a pragmatic Bayesian. And deep generative models and unsupervised learning are one way of doing this kind of density estimation. I'm not going to do part three of this lecture, but you're going to hear from Ulrich Paquet from and from um, David Bly, who will tell you, who will fill this part in for you all. And the simplest model in this area is to do factor analysis. Factor analysis is the foundation of all unsupervised learning and density estimation. If you know factor analysis, every other method is just some bells and whistles and a bit more complex on top of factor analysis. So factor analysis is the simple model. It says, I assume that there is an underlying cause Z, a latent variable, which gives rise to data Y. Again, as we said, when we observe, when we have things in our model that we can never observe, then we have to integrate it out. So in factor analysis, everything is linear. And in linear functions, we can compute everything in closed form. And so we can get a set of equations um, that are simple and easy to do. But more deep generative models, which are some of the work that I do, they have nonlinear functions. They need much more complex integration and other kinds of tools to do that kind of inference. Decision making is the last area. We op usually operate. That's how we all operate every day. We have a decision maker that can take actions within a world. That world is an environment, a simulation. It's your parents, as a young child might do. It's your supervisor, if you're a research student. It's your boss, if you're someone who has a boss. And then you observe observations, and then you can make decisions about that. So this is a very common setup. All of experimental design, all of causal learning, all of reinforcement learning, all of economics and utility theory operate in this simple um, perception action loop as it's called. So a probabilistic model over such settings says you have actions and you will put a probability distribution over those actions. You can interact with your environment. So in this case, I'm going to do only interaction. So you can apply your action to an environment and you can sample from that environment and you'll get a utility function. 
And that utility function, sometimes called a reward, if you're in reinforcement learning or if you're in engineering, you will call that a cost function or a cost. And then you can assign probability distribution over those utilities or over those rewards. Usually the simplest one is to just make an exponential because then we can normalize this distribution. And if you use this kind of probabilistic setup, you can recover a lot of reinforcement learning and other kinds of utility theory and information theory. I just want to make a quick comment around probabilistic dualities, that we use the tools of probability to connect and jump to other ways of doing probabilistic things. So I spoke to you a bit about deep networks, but I did not speak to you about kernel machines and Gaussian processes, which are ways of doing non-parametric models over functions and distributions. And there are easy ways to jump between them. If we use a set of dual functions to derive neural networks, we can easily obtain all of kernel machines. And kernel machines and deep networks are very intricately linked. So I can set, write a set of deep networks as a set of basis function regression. I'll leave this as an exercise to you for you to do afterwards. I can move from these primal variables, Ws and thetas, to a set of dual variables, which are variables over function. And I will recover, using the kernel trick, exactly the kind of kernelized regression, um, ridge regression, and functions over Hilbert spaces that we use when we think about kernel machines and kernel learning. And if I want to do probability distributions over those functions, I could either start from this kernel theory, put distributions over those functions, or use the non-parametric theory of statistics to start here directly, and I can recover Gaussian processes. And I can undo the limits in various ways, and do finite limits to go this way, do Bayesian inference to go this way, use dual functions to go this way. So if any of you are interested in this area, there's a set of two pages of equations that you can do to sort of prove all of these things to yourself. So, and I'll just mention one more thing about hierarchical and deep models, where um, we have all these prior distributions that we've been putting. Um, so I've you make a composition of models, P of ZL, ZL to ZL minus one, that hierarchy of distributions that I spoke in the beginning, and you get many kind of deep and hierarchical models. And deep models are hierarchical models, but not all hierarchical models are deep models. That's sort of the line that I use. Um, so here you have a deep regression. I have obs observations X, and I go through Y, and I have many intermediate layers of computation. And I may have a, if I have a generative model, I won't observe an input. I'll just be generating directly. And what makes it deep is that they are composed, and all the means of every one distribution are fed into the next layer. So a deep layer usually is a composition of means of distributions over a hierarchy. And you can get many other kinds of models, hierarchical mixture of experts or deep multi-view models, information bottleneck, lots of fun models to look at here. So I want to just wrap up in the last maybe 10 minutes um, that I have just to think about how it is, what are these foundations that we've been thinking about? How is it that you will approach your machine learning research and practice? So in general, starting from the very beginning, the story of Krotoa that I asked you, I will always ask you to think about your machine learning through a human-centered approach, through an interdisciplinary and human-centered approach. And the philosophy and framework that I like to look at is called Sun's phenomenological levels. These are levels of ways of thinking about how a model and how a set of computation can be used and how it interacts with other things. At the basic level, you have these physiological levels. For us, this is just where computation happens. Does computation happen in a brain? Does it happen in the machine? Does it happen in a cloud? Where are these physiological things? Then you have those componential components, those basic principles and uncertainties and information. What is uncertainty? How do you make predictions? How do you give explanations? Um, how do you do inference? Those are componential models. Then you have these psychological questions. How do you bring those tools together to do things like planning, explanation, causality, causation? And then the reason I like these is that it adds this other kind of layer on top, a sociological level, which says that there are also agents, systems, models interact in the world with other agents, other systems, other models, and we need to always consider those kind of impacts and those kind of interactions. So in general, I'll ask you to think about that, but for your machine learning core, there are two frameworks for thinking that are most popular these days. One of them is this architecture and loss paradigm of thinking. We'll describe it in a bit, and if you're using deep learning, mostly you will have this architecture loss kind of paradigm. 
And the one that I ask everyone to always use is this model inference and algorithm paradigm. So we'll look through both of them very quickly. So the architecture loss uh, paradigm asks you to split your thinking into two parts. One is to build computational graphs. You have a graph of the sequence of computations of things that you want to do. This graph um, connects inputs, parameters, other kinds of mathematical operations, convolutions, multiplication, etc. And this is the kind of thing that you implement and you reason about. It's important to reason about a computational graph because using that lets you reason about dependencies and how one variable is related to other variables, which is then useful later on for interventions and explanations and these kinds of things. And then usually the second phase is to do some form of error propagation. That there are errors that you check in the output or even in intermediate places, and those errors drive learning signals. They drive the way you will update parameters. They drive the way you will compute your probability distribution. And this kind of architecture and loss framework is very flexible. Not only deep learning uses this framework. Many other, if you're doing message passing, message passing with factor graphs operates in exactly the same framework of building a computational graph, which is the factor graph and then doing error propagation by propagating beliefs and messages through belief propagation back towards the truth. So this one is very flexible, um, and I think as we want to build more, in the end you will always end up using some form of this kind of thinking as you want to develop your thing to the output, because this kind of thinking allows you to do other levels of computer science that we need to think about, testing, verification, redeployment, online updating, continuous integration, these kind of things, and that's what you sort of need here. If we want to be more statistical, though, the one that I am a huge fan of is this what we call the model inference algorithm paradigm, that you have to split your thinking always into three parts. To think that there are models, models which are descriptions of the world, of data, of processes, of systems. Based on models, you need to choose a learning principle. How is it that when you observe data, you will connect that data to the model that you have? And for any combination of model and learning principle, you will have to develop an algorithm that combines the two together. And the way we do fair comparison, the way we do testing, the way we know that we are actually doing things correctly is by separating our thinking into these three ways. So I'm just going to give you a few examples. When we have models, there are many, many different kinds of models to think about. There are directed models like the Boltzmann machine, and there are undirected models, or undirected models like the Boltzmann machine, and directed models like the autoregressive model. There are fully observed models that just only look at data that you have observed and try to specify how they are related. There are latent variable models that have underlying variables that you cannot observe, but you want to use as part of your computation. And then you have parametric, non-parametric, and semi-parametric models. How you choose your model depends a lot on what you want to do. Every model comes with a trade-off. It comes with a trade-off of the kind of computation, the kind of flexibility, what kind of distributions, what kind of assumption, what kind of dimension it can handle. And so we need to sort of think about that in the choice of our model, and we need to be clear about the choice of our model. The second thing about learning principles, and I think, um, as I mentioned, statistical inference is a topic which is very uh, dear to me. I describe statistical inference into two different ways. There are either ways of doing inference which are direct inferences or indirect statistical inferences. Now, direct statistical inferences are all the kinds of inferences that we have looked at together in the section on estimation theory. They are inferences based on saying that the outcomes of data that you have have probabilities, and you can decide their probability by choosing a likelihood function. So in this case, you have many things. We looked at maximum likelihood. We looked at maximum a posteriori. Um, but there are many other ways of doing that. You're going to look at variational inference with both Ulrich and David. Um, and there are other ways in, in, in statistics, integrated nested Laplace approximations. I think Ian, or I don't know if there's someone doing Markov chain Monte Carlo, sequential Monte Carlo. There are many ways of doing these direct inferences that we've worked on over the years. And then there are other ways of when you can't write out a likelihood function or you don't want to specify the likelihood function because of concerns of mess specification or you only have access to a simulator of your data, then we have other ways of doing inference. I call those indirect inferences. These are the method of moments, which is one of the oldest inferential methods we have, two sample testings that we can use to learn parameters rather than only just doing hypothesis testing, approximate Bayesian computation. When you speak to Arthur, he will talk a little bit about maximum mean discrepancy, transportation method, and I hope there are many more in this indirect uh, space of inference for us to think about. 
And then you have algorithms. For a given model and a learning principle, they can be combined in many different ways. If you have a convolutional neural network plus penalized maximum likelihood as your inference, you can create the algorithm in many different ways. You can use your optimization in different ways. You can use different kinds of regularization. You can split the computation differently, uh, asynchronously or synchronously or under different accelerators in these. So it matters to think about what is the principle, wha what is the model, and how is the algorithm is being done. You can use in undirected models the restricted Boltzmann machine and do maximum likelihood estimation. There are many ways of building the final algorithm based on those two principles. We can do contrastive divergence, persistent contrastive divergence, some kind of parallel tempering, natural gradient methods. There are many different ways of doing that. And how we need to compare is only by fixing the right kind of element. If we're doing latent variable models as our probabilistic model and we're using variational inference as our inferential principle, even that can be implemented in many different ways. We can implement it using the variational EM algorithm, using expectation propagation, using approximate message passing as a variational autoencoder. We sort of do need to think. And the last one are implicit generative models and the principle of two sample testing. We can implement that in many different ways, what uh, Hastie and Tipsharani call unsupervised as supervised learning, using this principle of approximate Bayesian computation uh, in the algorithm that maybe many of you are familiar with, which are called generative adversarial networks. So these are the way things come together. These are my final words. Think of probability in your default definition as the subjective probability, the probability of a degree of belief. That probabilistic and always apply probabilistic descriptions to the data and the systems that you are working with. We have many different ways of thinking about connecting data to our models and building algorithms. By building probabilistic models, thinking about the role of likelihood functions, using composition, and thinking about what is typical and what is maximal. And finally, always use the model inference and algorithm paradigm in your thinking. So that's my first part. Thanks very much. I don't know if there are a few questions that we can take um, or we can take a break and come back afterwards. Are there some? What questions do you have? Okay, yeah. So the statement here is about this question on this statement on robustness to overfitting of Bayesian methods. Every method, regardless of what it is, can be subject to overfitting. And this is true in general. The statement that I'm trying to make about is the effort that you need to do of detecting your overfitting and controlling your overfitting. So Bayesian methods, I think, are very natural because of all the advantages that I said earlier around composition, including knowledge which is outside of your data, those kind of structural constraints, to add that into the model to make them robust to this overfitting because they are natural things. The second thing which I think is very important is to consider that when we are Bayesian, we are always integrating over sets of parameters. And integration is a very fundamentally different operation than just taking gradients and then doing ensembles, for example, which is uh, other ways of doing that or regularizing deeply. So there is something very fundamentally different which is happening, but that fundamental difference doesn't mean that you are immune forever and always from the question of overfitting. This, this question is very foundational and you know, I'm not saying anyone should not think about overfitting. You have to think about it very seriously because regardless of the method, overfitting is an issue. Um, any one more question? Yeah? Um, okay, let me just pull that slide up for you. Um, so again, the, the precision of the statement that I want to make is that not that you should use one or the other, but that you should always be flexible to be able to jump between using both of them. But the architecture loss paradigm, I think, is very useful when you are in the in implementation phase and you need to get stuff done. And that is sort of naturally a very good way of thinking about how to do the software engineering of that. 
But now if you're doing research over new kinds of methods, then you need to be able to control very carefully to say what exactly is different between these two different methods. Are they fundamentally something different or is it actually just, is there some component which is different and what is the thing? So let me give you a very precise um, example here. This one here is the one that I've worked on most, latent variable models. A latent variable model always has this latent variable and unobserved cause and some set of data and I have to connect these two. Now for many years, and variational inference is a very general principle. It says that I need to compute the evidence P of X. Because there is Z, I can't know that, so I'm going to compute a bound on P of X instead. So that principle is very generic. Now, there are many different ways of implementing that algorithm. What is different about implementing that algorithm? If you know that very clearly, then you can say that, well, what is different is the algorithmic implementation part. Now, um, a different way would be to say that you are taking two different models and then doing variational inference. And then you can claim it's something very different, but are you making a statement about the performance of a model or the performance of the in inference? So if you are separ separating these things, you are controlling them correctly, you are fixing the inferential principle and changing the model, or more typically the thing you want to do is fix the model and change the inferential principle and then compare, then this is the way to make clear, correct comparisons of the way what's actually going on and for us then to give the practical guidance when we want to move to the other phase um, and what are the guarantees. Another question on this side maybe? Yes? Okay, so we were talking about here about likelihoods in general. So misspecification is a principle of model building. So this probabilistic philosophy that we use is sort of something outside that. We will always have this issue of misspecification of a model. And Bayesian methods can fail very badly under misspecified cases as can frequentist cases. So this is I don't know actually what the solution, there are ways of detecting misspecification, which is why later on I was sort of driving on about the importance of having ways of doing model complexity and model selection principles, because then you can actually use those as tests of misspecification or degree of misspecification. Some misspecification will always be fine, because that's the statement, all mod models are bad, some are useful. Um, but, you know, practically this is where we have to now work with our domain experts very deeply and it's, it takes a very long time to work with your domain expert to actually understand where the sources of misspecification comes from. It takes usually like a year of you being confused together until you get to that point. So again, I think this is the point where, you know, thinking about that sociological aspect of research comes into play that we can think about statistically but we also have to think about in the domain um, that we're working in. Shall we take a break now? Okay.